Hi, you're listening to the Psychopharmacology Institute podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Wagdan Rashad, and this is the show that aims to help you, the mental health clinician, stay sharp on Psychopharm. Ah, it's the festive season once again, and the year is drawing to an end. How was your 2019? You know, I appreciate this time of year, despite the hustle and bustle. It's a good chance to reflect back and think ahead as well. I mean, sometimes we do need a social construct, such as the year ending, as a motive to reflect. Though, we could do it every day. Anyhow, I don't want to get too philosophical. This podcast episode is the last one of 2019. We have had such an amazing year with the podcast this year. Today, I wanted to take this episode as an opportunity to reflect with you on your life. (laughs) No, just kidding. We will reflect on Psychopharm updates. What happened this year in Psychopharm, girls and boys? Let the show begin. Well, hello, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. Psych Nugget O'Joy. And today, we have in store for you shiny, new, FDA-approved agents that'll make you go... Oh my lorazepam, pan. An IV drug for postpartum depression? An injection for hypoactive sexual desire? Or maybe a spray up your nose for depression that just won't go? Today, we talk that and more. And that was just the trailer. Jeez. Okay, let's start with Brexanolone. Brexanolone, or its trade name Zolreso, is the first ever drug to be FDA approved for postpartum depression. We will refer to it as PPD. Now, how likely are you to have used this drug or will use it anytime soon? Um, the chances are pretty slim because it's darn expensive. One treatment, which is basically five vials of this magic potion, actually costs 34,000 US dollars. Nuts, right? Now, there are lots of things that are special about Brexanolone. First, it's given in an IV infusion form for a, wait for it, 60-hour infusion period. So we're talking about two and a half days to take one infusion. Obviously, you'd have to be admitted to the hospital and not agitated, or else those expensive droplets. Oh, I don't want to even think about it. But jokes aside, what is this drug made of? Well, basically, it's an exogenous form of allopregnanolone. Allopregnanolone is a neurosteroid that occurs naturally in our bodies. During pregnancy, levels rise gradually, peaking in the third trimester. Then boom, it drops sharply after birth. It's been implicated that when levels of allopregnanolone drop, it could contribute to the symptoms of PPD. So what allopregnanolone actually does is to fiddle about with the GABA-A receptors. It is a GABA-A receptor modulator. Alcohol, benzos, and barbiturates are also GABA-A receptor modulators. So as you can deduce, one of the major side effects of brexanolone is sedation. Actually, it has a black box warning. Wait, let me use my black box warning voice. Patients treated with brexanolone are at risk of excessive sedation or sudden loss of consciousness during administration. Continuous pulse oximetry monitoring is required. There you go. Now, the final point I wanted to raise was efficacy. Is it worth it? Well, it has been shown to be modestly more efficacious than placebo in reducing depressive symptom scores in women with moderate to severe PPD. Shall we use it? Well, I'll leave that up to you. Next, we talk about hypoactive sexual desire disorder or HSDD. If this sounds unfamiliar to you, I'll tell you why later. Okay, so the reason that hypoactive sexual desire disorder may sound a little bit far off for some of our listeners is that it actually isn't in the DSM-5 anymore. In the DSM-5, it's been split into male hypoactive sexual desire disorder and female sexual interest slash arousal disorder. Yeah. In a nutshell, this diagnosis is characterized by a lack or absence of sexual fantasies and desire for sexual activity. Okay, so what? That happens. For this to be regarded as a disorder, it must cause marked distress or interpersonal difficulties for the individual. 
and it cannot be sufficiently explained by another mental or medical condition or substance use. So why am I talking about this? Well, we have a new drug approval for, listen carefully, premenopausal women with acquired generalized HSDD. Let's unpack. We all know premenopausal. Check. Acquired and generalized HSDD. What does that even mean? Well, acquired refers to the fact that previously this person had no major issues with sexual desire. And generalized means that no amount or form of stimulation, situation, or partner can arouse them. So we have a new drug approved for this, or rather wizardry. Isn't it fascinating to think that something like sexual desire and fantasy could be activated with some neurochemistry? The agent is called bremelanotide, or vilesi. I don't know where they get these names from. Never mind. Bremelanotide. The melano part of the name suggests how it works. It acts as an agonist at some melanocortin receptors. What's melanocortin got to do with sexual desire? Well, interestingly, this relationship was discovered accidentally when a study was looking at the association of melanocortins and tanning. They found that these melanocortins had, and this is not my own terminology, erectogenic properties in men and sexual libido enhancement in women, too. Let's take a breather. Literally. Okay. Bremelanotide is given by subcutaneous injection at least 45 minutes before anticipated sexual activity. Hmm. Also, if that doesn't manage to turn the patient off more than they are already turned off, Bremelanotide can make you nauseated and need antiemetic therapy. And it can cause you to also get nice dark blotches all over your skin. Fun. I know I sound quite sarcastic about it, but this isn't to downplay the importance of these advances in psychopharm. There is definitely lots of room for more agents that help our patients live better. It's just that we also need to look at what comes our way critically and keep in mind how this would fit in with the real world clinical population. Talking about the real world, This treatment costs nearly 950 US dollars per dose. Now, is it worth it? Well, clinical trials have shown that it's only modestly more effective than placebo in increasing sexual desire and decreasing associated distress. And uh, yeah, that's about it for bromelanotide. In psychiatry, there seems to be a shift in our approach to routes of administration. I mean, look, brexanolone in IV infusion, bromelanotide in subcutaneous, and two more, esketamine in intranasal administration, and acenapine in skin patch. Earlier this year, we released two podcasts on the latter two agents, esketamine and acenapine. This time, I will just briefly skim through them, and if you want to know more, just check out the episodes in our podcast library. Actually. I have an idea. Let's try to summarize both the Cenapine and Esketamine in 60 seconds. Ready? Start the clock. Transdermal Esenapine or Sequato was FDA approved for schizophrenia in October 2019. The patch is applied once daily and provides sustained concentrations of Esenapine over 24 hours. What's different about it? Well, it offers visual confirmation that the treatment is being taken. Otherwise, it's just the same as sublingual acenapine. The downsides, there are actually no published trials that directly compare transdermal and sublingual acenapine. Escanamine or Spravato is a nasal spray approved for adult TRD in conjunction with an oral antidepressant. Yes, in conjunction. Escanamine is an NMDA antagonist with a possible role in activating new opioid receptors. The most common side effect in clinical trials were dissociation and dizziness. Esketamine also increases blood pressure, and so it's contraindicated for aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations, and a history of intracerebral hemorrhage. Whew, I did it. Wow. So far, we've spoken about rexanolone, remelanotide, esketamine, and transdermal acenapine. Our final star of the show is cariprazine. Cariprazine, you say? That's not new. You're right, it isn't new. However, it's just been FDA approved this year for a new indication. Bipolar depression. Cariprazine or Drylar is a lot like aripiprazole and brexpiprazole. It's a D2 and 5-HT1A 
partial agonist. So now, cariprazine may join its three other siblings in the list of FDA-approved agents for bipolar depression. And they are... 1. Olanzapine floxetine combo 2. Quetiapine and quetiapine extended release 3. Luracidone And now 4. Cariprazine And believe it or not, folks, that's about it for today's podcast. Oh, wait, I'm getting a notification here. Ooh, we have another FDA approval, guys. Okay, cut the music. Right. So, new medication for adult schizophrenia. It's called lumeteperone. It's actually the first of its class. What's this new class, I hear you ask? We actually don't know, since not a lot is known about its mechanism of action. The release notes from intracellular therapy stated that its action could be mediated through, quote, through a combination of antagonistic activity at central 5-HT2A receptors and postsynaptic antagonistic activity at central D2 receptors. Meh. We will possibly find out more in 2020. Anyhow, it's an oral medication taken once a day, And there is a black box warning for use in dementia-related psychosis. All right, that's enough for today. I hope you liked today's episode and learned something new. I've been waiting all year to say this. All righty, folks, I'll see you next year. Oh, well, key points first. Rexadolone is approved for postpartum depression given an IV infusion and acts as a GABA-A receptor modulator. Bremelanotide is for hypoactive sexual desire disorder in premenopausal women, given in a subcutaneous injection and acts as an agonist on the melanocortin receptors. Transdermal acenapine is the first skin patch antipsychotic. It is approved for adult schizophrenia. Esketamine is administered intranasally for treatment-resistant depression in adults who are taking another antidepressant. It is an NMDA receptor antagonist. Cariprazine is now FDA-approved for bipolar 1 depression. Lumeteperone has just been approved for adult schizophrenia as the first of class antipsychotic. Today's podcast is based off our open article entitled 2019 in Review, written by our very own Dr. Flavio Guzman. Check out our website, and if you're interested in earning CME credits, go to PIUpdates.com and become a premium member already. If you're a psychiatrist in the US, we also offer SA credits. You can go to our website and join our newsletter to receive weekly updates delivered straight to your inbox. The following people participated in this episode. Dr. Flavio Guzman as a general editor, Andy Rode as the audio engineer, Pamela Gonzalez as a project manager, and myself, Dr. Wegdan Rashad, as the host. Thank you for joining us in today's podcast. Until the next episode in 2020, goodbye. Goodbye.